All right. Um, it is 5.04. Um, apologize for a little bit delay there. I'm going to call the, um, this meeting into order. Um, here with me are um, committee member Linda Kochmar, um, Leandra Kraft. We also have um, council president Honda, uh, council member Lydia, Lydia Asefa Dawson and Greg Russo. Welcome. Wow, it feels so different after how many months? 16 months on Zoom. So it's really good to see everybody here uh, in person. So thank you for being here. All right. So um, the first thing to do is public comments. Do we have any public comments? No public comments. All right. Thank you. Moving on to uh, committee business, the first item, item A, is approval of summary minutes for June 22nd, 2021. Oh, another, we, um, another thing I need to mention is um, I forgot my uh, reading classes, so I will try to do my best <laughs> not to read you know, something funnier, but um, if, uh, if I read something wrong, please correct me. Uh, well, I move to approve the summary minutes from June 22nd, 2021. I'll second that. Okay. We have a motion to approve the summary minutes for June 20, uh, 20, 22, 20, I'm sorry, straight that. June 22nd, 2021. And we have a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 The matter passed 3 0. We are moving on to item B, um, tourism enhancement grant recommendation for July through December of 2021. And Tim Johnson, welcome. Thank you, committee chair, committee members, council member, council president. Um, <clears throat> it's been, when you talk about 16 months, it's been quite some time before we've been able to approve a tourism enhancement grant program. Uh, but we are now up with the one and only that uh, that it was able to um, actually be carried out in this second round, which goes from basically June through, pardon me, July through December. And the uh, Tourism Enhancement Grant Subcommittee recommended on to the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee and they're subsequently recommending um, to FEDRAC and on to the City Council for consent, a $3,000 reward to the Northern Classic Body Building Championships. Um, this is an organization that we have funded before, done very well. If something should happen in the event uh, associated with the virus, they do have a plan B. It can go on. They can deal with a, a smaller audience in the way that they've got it configured. So this is a really good program. We look forward to whatever the circumstances are having this at the Performing Arts and Events Center. So with that, we hope that you would uh, support the recommendation of the tourism grant um, for uh, uh, this round of $3,000. Any questions? Thank you, Tim. Committee members, do you have any questions? Um, no, I move to. Go ahead. Thanks, Tim. They asked for five thousand. So they did. Why was uh, since they're the only one who applied? Why why did they not get the five thousand? Well, well, first of all, you, you, when you look at these numbers, uh, it looks at hotel rooms, and so the size of the event really justifies. We've done these now for almost a decade and we've gotten pretty good at, at, at looking at the ratio of hotel rooms to the amount of ward and this falls right into that uh, sweet spot and that's about where it's at and the the last time they they had received 2500 so this is um, an increase of five hundred dollars from the last time they, they submitted okay thank you okay. council members do you have any other questions? Actually, I do. I, do, you, do you know if we'll be getting uh, the diving championships again? 
So uh, let's see. There's a couple different diving. So are you saying uh, the Olympic dive trials? Well, anything. Okay. <laughs> anything so, diving. Yeah. Well. Brings so, tourism. Yeah, I, I didn't want to take up a whole lot of time because I know you got a full agenda. I'll be very succinct about this. A couple things that happened. One, we lost uh, because of the pandemic, the the 2021 men's and women's NC2A swimming and diving championships this year. Those were supposed to be held at the end of March, 1st of April. That was done specifically by the universities and the NC2A because of the pandemic, which was unfortunate because, you know, it takes us almost five year run up to apply for that and then get um, awarded. The next time, and, and I think you may have recalled, I've told all of you this while we were going through the pandemic, that we did apply and we did a win again for the NC2As, and that will occur not until 2025. But I am pleased to say this, to give you an indication of the level of sophistication which we have. We are the only city in the United States that gets both the men's and women's in the same year. Nobody else does. So what that means for us is two weeks of over 30,000 people being in federal way and 14 days of being on NBC television on prime time. So it is really enormous um, activity for us. Now, in between that, because of the delay associated with or the postponement of the Olympics, uh, we're already being asked to prepare for the 2024 U.S. Olympic dive trials. And that application is being prepared as we speak. Um, before Mr. Arawula can slip out the door, he has been instrumental in working with the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee on the set aside of those dollars for those events. And so we are uh, all prepared, all ready to go. Our partners are, of course, King County, the Seattle Sports Commission. And um, we're, we're pretty excited that we will have uh, an award-winning uh, application. So those come through. Okay. Let me just also go back to say with you again, there was a major change that occurred a week ago in college sports. And that occurred with um, teams shifting from one uh, conference to the next. And while you know that uh, the Pac-12 um, canceled their, uh, uh, their championship, conference championship here in federal way and moved to one week was in Arizona and the other week was in uh, Texas. They will be coming back for the 2022 championship. However, because of the changes that may be going on with conferences, college conferences, we've been put on notice that um, we're not sure how long that might exist under the banner of the Pac-12. The Pac-12 may manifest itself into something else that may be even bigger and, and larger than what we've ever hosted before, at which case it presents an incredible opportunity for us to have even a larger tourism uh, event in, in federal way. So there's a whole lot of exciting things that are coming down the pathway for us. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Tim. So, um, Chair, I move uh, to forward the proposed agreement to the August 10, 2021 consent agenda for approval. Second. Okay. So we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, is there any other discussion or questions for Tim? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 The matter passed 3-0. Now we are moving on to item C. Uh, purchase of a little vacuum. Uh, EJ. Good evening, Chair Tran, Council President, members of Council. Thank you. So, as you mentioned, it's been a while since we've been in person, and I believe this is my first time standing back at this podium in like 16 months as well. It's a little, uh, a little different than Zoom. So if it is okay with you, Chair, the, the background information for the next two items is all related and intertangled, to say the least. So um, I've, in the preparation of this presentation, covered the background for both, and then obviously they can both be discussed individually. Sure. Um, but recognizing that this is a little bit of a long agenda, so to try and not just repeat the same presentation a second time. All right. Yeah, um, thank you. 
And Council President, I did receive the questions that were forwarded to me today, so I believe I've incorporated your questions in here, but if not, please feel free to expand. Um, so with that being said, the first item is item C, and the policy question is, should City Council authorize staff to purchase a litter vacuum for a price not to exceed $90,000 using unallocated public works surface water management operations budget? It's a mouthful. Item D on your agenda is, just for the purpose of the record, should City Council authorize the creation and transfer of one existing litter control position to operate out of the Solid Waste Utility Fund 106, and the creation and transfer of one existing litter control position to operate out of the Arterial Street Fund Fund 102, and backfill the two existing positions within the Streets Account Fund 101. And we'll get into that one in a minute. So background information that applies to both of these. So during 2020, per the direction of the mayor and the city council, we as public works started performing litter control on a dedicated basis within the right of way. We have two staff and one truck. This is what they do 40 hours a week. Um, at the end of 2020, the Eyes on Federal Way, which is through the C Click Fix application, was released publicly. With both of these, the numbers that of requests that Public Works is dealing with has risen significantly. Um, so to put that into context, in 2017, just for litter and vegetation, we received 356 requests from the community. 2018, we've received 427. 2019, we saw a huge spike. This is why we implemented the two litter control positions. Um, you can see we more than doubled in one year. Um, on litter control, and we went up to 1,326 total requests. Um, and that is all requests, so that's not just, I guess to be clear, that's the all of the service requests that came from the community, not just these two categories, if that makes sense. So that's everything that came in, every community really question. 2020, um, we saw another significant increase. Um, this year, um, as of now, we have actually surpassed where we have all of 2020. We actually have over 2,200 requests. But through the end of June, we received 1,785 and over 1,000 requests specifically related to litter. Um, that's a lot, um, frankly. So where we are pacing um, is based on the trending that we're seeing and the rates we're seeing, we are expecting to receive 4,105 requests just for litter and vegetation this year. So our total request is gonna be somewhere, it's projected around 6,000 just from this year from the community. So um, if you work the math five days a week, that works out to 20 litter requests a day that we're receiving from the community. On average, it takes us anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours to deal with each request, um, depending on whether it's you know a simple soda cup or if it's you know <coughs> bags and bags of trash or like today, multiple appliances. So some background information on specifically what we did um, around Eyes on Federal Way. So we did review other local cities. Um, we had a team of directors, including myself, the parks director, community development director, finance director, um, that sat down and went through this. Um, we looked at other surrounding cities, so Renton, Kent, Auburn, Puyallup, SeaTac, a couple others that have implemented this. Based on their feedback, um, we did expect to see roughly a 47 to 50 percent increase within three to six months. We are right on that curve, so that we are pretty much seeing exactly the numbers we projected. Um, we are projected if it if everything remains the same pace as what was the feedback we got from these other cities, it should normalize at about a year, and we will continue to see an increase up until we hit a year. So fundamentally, this got down to a little bit of a policy question and a, and a city's, the city's approach. We know tonnage um, being weight, not tons as in like a broad number, of trash that we're removing from the streets. We had two staff and one truck dedicated to it. The tons of material removed from the street hasn't changed. Our staff, it's actually gone up slightly, but for conversation's sake, it really hasn't changed. The number of... Um, trees that we trim really hasn't changed. Um, all of the stuff that we do, the hours that we spend, hasn't changed. What has changed is the citizen's ability or the community's ability to report it and their expectations. 
So with that, um, we posed, that collective group that I shared, posed three different scenarios. Um, and there was a, a conversation of, you know, option one is to address the same number of requests, basically continue the staffing levels that we're at today, knowing that there would be no staff availability to address an increase. So that's kind of option one, is to keep Keep the status quo, keep removing the same number of tons of trash from the street, same number of shopping carts, deal with the same amount of graffiti, trim the same number of trees, um, and see where it falls. Option two, for public works specifically, our level of service standard and goal pre-Eyes on Federal Way was to address 80% of citizen requests within 48 hours and understand that the last 20% would take longer. That was our goal, it's been our goal for the last 15 years. So um, if we, option two was basically to maintain that same 20% open. So going back to the numbers, if we were receiving, just for easy numbers and the sake of conversation, if we saw 50 requests, you know, that would be 10 requests did not get resolved if they stayed open. Multiplying it by a factor of four, which is about what we did, instead of 200 requests, we would see, what's that, 40 requests stay open as opposed to 10. So we're keeping that same, the percentages are staying the same, but the number is increasing. Option three is to try and address the full increase in requests, but uh, you know, so, uh, so the 20% would actually come down slightly, so it would stay, in, in my example of 50 requests coming in, it would remain 10 requests stay open. So we then took that and backed into the staffing requirements based on what we know and years of data of how long it takes to deal with citizen requests, and that's what's on your screen in front of you. Um, so keeping it the same, obviously there's no staff impact there. Maintaining the um, previous 20% would have required adding three staff to both public works and parks and two additional vehicles to each. and trying to keep that same 10 number in my example would be five and four in both departments. Um, both of the, all of these scenarios also had a suggestion to add one staff member to IT um, to operate the system. Ultimately, the direction we received was to implement Eyes on Federal Way under option one um, and to continue to maintain the tonnages of trash that we were removing off the street, do everything we're doing today, evaluate it, and then adjust as needed in the future. So we're in the future. Um, and that's how we got to be where we are. So with the new impact, so this is the part that we were not expecting um, to be completely transparent. This is the part that none of those cities that I mentioned shared with us. The community's expectations have changed. Um, so historically before this, we would, if we received a request, it came in, someone called in one of my admins and they said, hey, there's trash on the corner of 320th and Pack Highway. We wouldn't hear about it again for about five to seven days. You know, if, if we just left it, and not that we intentionally ever do that, to be clear, but you know, if we just left it, it would be about five to seven days before that resident would call back. Now what we're seeing is we are getting multiple forms of communication from the same resident within 24 hours. Um, case in point, we received a request last night at about midnight, and we had that same citizen calling us before 7 a.m. this morning to complain it wasn't resolved. And that's become normal. So what does all this mean? Um, you know, it's a lot of information, but what does it mean? Um, so it means in practice that request to litter has more than doubled in response time since last fall. Non-litter, so whether it's vegetation trims, a, a sign is leaning, um, it's more than tripled. Um, the amount of work we're getting done, we found some other efficiencies. The leaf vacuum is an example um, where we're actually more efficient than we were. We're getting more work done. Um, but we were never staffed to handle 4,000 requests in a year. Um, so what it means in practice is we're diverting staff from critical maintenance activities. Um, you know, and we talked about not the last council retreat, but the one before that. Um, we talked with council, last one at Dumas Bay, about that we had seven years of open workload if we did not receive another request within seven years. Um, so that number has continually grown. So what are those, some of those critical things we're not doing? We're not repairing potholes. We're not addressing sidewalks. We're only trimming vegetation that's requested by citizens. They're, we're not proactively doing it. Most of the preventative maintenance we're not doing. Um, city beautification requests, I, I, you know, I put this on here. Um, 
this is things like the fountain at 320th and Pack Highway, the, the salmon fountain. Um, if you've noticed, it's not on. Um, we don't have the staff to check it on a daily basis right now. Um, so it's things like that. The exception to that is the flower baskets. Um, you know, that's, I know that's a sensitive subject to council and it's an awesome program. So we have continued to support that. Um, but other than that, the city beautification programs, we're having a hard time supporting. Um, so as the workload continues to increase, we're, we're doing everything we can to find efficiencies. Um, and you know, that's part of the reason we're here tonight. Um, we've done that principally through investing in equipment. We've also done it through investing in uh, vehicle routing um, programming. So we don't divert staff from one thing to another. We optimize their time to, like if we have six requests, we make sure it's routed, not you know pinballed around the city, if that makes sense, to try and minimize the amount of driving time. We're doing things, uh, the fancy term is dynamic work planning, um, but really what that means is building into the schedule um, a, a flex, knowing that we're gonna have to account for some of this in our workload management, um, and that we know we have citizen requests. Um, you know, and we are doing everything we can to take advantage of operational efficiencies. So that's kind of the background for the next two items. So going specifically to the first item, the litter vacuum. This is what a litter vacuum is. So it's a low speed road, road legal vehicle. Um, and I've got a couple more pictures for you as well. It's designed to pick up discarded litter. Um, it is, you know, categorically, according to OSHA, an improvement to staff safety because staff is not directly contacting the litter. Uh, locally, it's being used by the Port of Seattle, SeaTac, SeaTac City. Um, Kent recently bought one. Um, Kirkland has several. Bellevue has several. Um, the city of Seattle has several, as well as some other cities. So it does increase the area. It's basically a um, large golf cart sized vehicle with a giant vacuum on the back of it um, with a robot arm that goes along and picks up trash. So instead of having someone walk down 320th, we can, this thing fits on the sidewalk, we can actually drive down the sidewalk and staff never exits. They use a robot arm to pick up all the trash at basically 10 miles an hour, assuming there's no pedestrians on the sidewalk. Um, it is something that can be used by parks. So one example would be at the movie night this past weekend where there was a, another rental in the park in advance and then movie night the same day. This is equipment that the parks department could also use to prepare the park. You can drive it on the grass. Um, and it is available through state contract. We're not going out to bid on this. So the options to consider are to authorize staff to purchase this or to not authorize staff. Um, the mayor's recommending option one. It is coming out of, I think I kind of glossed over it, but surface water, unrestricted funding, or uh, sorry, unallocated, not unrestricted, unallocated funding. Um, so it's basically a little bit of savings from last year um, is what's funding this purchase. And that is a picture of actually CTAC, the city of SeaTax unit. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions on this item. Thank you, Chair. Committee members, do you have any questions for Chair? I do. Thank Go you. Um, thank you, Chair Tran. EJ, how long does a um, piece of equipment like this last? And what is the maintenance, like the upkeep needed? Um, so the, it, the design life is 12 years. Um, it has a warranty for five, um, but the manufacturer's expectation is 12. Um, as far as upkeep, it's something that our fleet staff can easily upkeep, uptake. It's, easy, it's easier than most of the other equipment we already have. Thank you. Uh, I want one for my yard. <laughs> me too. <laughs> for my brush. And actually, I just want to drive it. I want, I want a picture <laughs> me of me too. driving it somewhere. <laughs> can, can we use this for the encampments if necessary? So it is off-road. Um, we can use it anywhere we can get to. It's not four-wheel drive. So it is off-road. You can drive it across like a soccer field or a park. It doesn't necessarily do that well driving like through trees and over routes and stuff like that. Um, but like the park and rides. Park and rides, you could use it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and it does pick up needles. Yeah, um, that is one of the things that, that it will pick up. That's what I was thinking too, yeah. yeah. Thank and you. it has a hard side container inside the unit that you pick out the whole thing, so staff's not contacting the needles. We're not touching a trash bag. Cool, wonderful. Very nice. Okay. Council member Lydia. Yeah, thank you, Chair Tron. Um, so you, there were three options. 
Um, and now, I'm, but I only see two. But my question is, it was option one that that was authorized, right? Or that's yeah. So that was when we implemented Eyes on Federal Way. As far as the staffing <coughs> goes, there were three different options to staff <coughs> it. So basically, wait and see right. with the and maintain the existing tonnages, which is what was done. Right. Option two was kind of a hybrid do some but not all and option three was try and maintain the level of service that we had pre eyes on federal way um, so that tonight for council it, it's should we purchase this or not um, but in the context of history of why are we not keeping up anymore and why do we need resources um, I and to answer some of the questions we received thought it was important to share that with council so when we have the litter pickup one person will be doing this right so is it going to necessitate at some point to purchase two or multiple and how, what are other cities doing and how are they funding it um so in a lot of different ways is the short answer um so a lot of the cities do have just one um it it won't pick up a mattress or a refrigerator obviously um so we still need staff to go out and do that sort of work as well so i mean it's not it's not going to take two positions and turn it into one um, but it will, when we go out and do litter picks along 320th Pack Highway, you know, arterials where we're not picking up sofas, we're picking up stuff people have thrown out their windows, frankly. Um, it will let us use one staff member at a much higher speed and cover a lot more ground, while the other staff member can be out dealing with mattresses and other stuff, um, larger stuff that this can't pick. Um, as far as other cities, um, so the port has five or six of them. Um, Seattle has multiple, Bellevue has multiple, Kirkland has one, Kent has one. Um, Renton's evaluating it as well, they're in the same boat we are. Um, at this point, if it works really well and we really have that much efficiencies and continue to see increased, we might come back at some point in the future and ask to purchase a second one. Right now, that's not in our plan, but I'm, I'm not gonna say we're not gonna ever do it either. Thank you. Also, President Honda. Thank you. I have a few questions. Sure. And you did answer the questions I, I sent. So what does this machine do with needles? Because we don't want needles in a general trash bag. So it picks it, the container inside of it is hard-sided. Um, so it picks it up into the hard-sided container. Um, and then we tip the container into the general use dumpster and we notify waste management that it does contain needles and they do not touch it with their hands they use equipment to do it as well it's the same process we're using today interesting yeah um hmm. okay well then i have to ask someone else about needles because i my understanding has always been that since needles could contain something that's um infectious or we don't want in the general garbage why we would but I'll, I'll ask that to someone else who might know that answer sure. so can one staff member truly pick up a refrigerator by themselves uh not we use equipment to do it so okay. uh, the litter truck that we use has a, it's called a tommy gate so the gate actually lowers down to the ground as a flat platform so they lower that down then they actually back up under the refrigerator then the platform lifts the unit into the and we do washing machines refrigerators all those large appliances are done the same way um, car engines we find occasionally are the same thing um, where we use the Tommy gate to actually lift it into the truck there's not a staff member that's lifting those okay and then do they get them out of the truck the same way uh, the t truck dumps oh okay so um, I want to go back to when we started eyes on federal way I might be wrong but I believe we told people that they could call into use the app and that we would turn around their request within 24 to 48 hours I think that's pretty much what we told people in the beginning uh, it didn't come from me no I know it didn't come from you I didn't come from us either it came from someone else um, so I think the public had an expectation mm -hmm. and obviously that expectation even in the beginning couldn't be followed I know my husband called in once and it took five days to pick up whatever he was um, <coughs> writing in about but 
if we knew if, if if you as the directors knew that we were going to have this issue sooner than later why did we rush it seems like we rushed forward to do the eyes on on federal way when we weren't necessarily prepared staff wise to do it and it's frustrating to me because I hear the complaints from the citizens and I and I think as staff you all must be complaining behind <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it just is it's frustrating because I, I maybe we should have waited until we were better equipped to launch this that's just what I would say but um, thank you very much I, I do have a question um, regarding the um, the number of reports that we received from the ICE, um, from the from the apps so the number that you provided are those un duplicate number or no it's um, no so the program and director Fitchner can probably explain this a little better than I can the program proactively looks to see if it is a duplicate um, so like if you submit garbage on the corner of an intersection that's unresolved if a second person comes along and tries to take a picture or send and or pin the same category at the same location it'll ask it is it this and if the answer is yes it will not create a duplicate um, beyond that internally staff also works to deduplicate so we go in and effectively close it and say duplicate ticket c s 101 whatever the rest of the number is um, so it gets filtered out in the report that I'm sharing with you. I see. Okay, thank you. Council Member Baruso. Yes, the chair attorney. Uh, EJ, I just had a question on the, almost on the lines of uh, Council President Honda. So on the machine itself, what kind of, is there any training that has to go along with that, number one? And then yes. Number two, um, as for picking up anything other than needles that might be hazardous, how are our folks trained to uh, look at those? If they're not on the ground seeing it and they're using the machine, would they be able to recognize something and not pick it up? Um, so it, it does require training um, to, to answer that question. And the training is fairly short and, you know, it's no different than like a bucket truck, for example. Right. It's, you know, a couple hours, but it, yes, it does require training. Um, as far as materials, um, most of the hazardous materials we run into are not things that would, this machine would pick up. Okay. Um, so the most common ones we run into are paint and motor oil, mm -hmm. um, and, it, and this machine is not going to lift either one of those. Um, and staff is, you know, even at speeds, staff is, it's pretty well drilled into staff not to do that. And, and frankly, our litter crew, we do pick all that stuff up, and it gets segregated in the truck, and then when they get back to the yard, it gets dealt with depending on what the material is. Um, but, yeah, it's, I don't foresee that being a large issue. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Good discussion. Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, yes, Chair Chen, I'm, I'm wondering. Um, oh, Mr. Chair, just so that before the committee uh, votes on this, this is a new appropriation. So they are using, yes, they are using the fund balance in the fund, but it's a new appropriation. So at some point, the whole council will have to approve the ordinance that will increase the budget. So I don't think, so if it goes to the full committee, the full council, they need to be aware of that. This committee cannot increase the appropriation, just so that you know. So. Ode, thank you for that. So just to be sure, this $90,000 is the new, uh, budget request right correct okay Thank so you. and I think what finance director is saying mm -hmm. is to put this on business um, as opposed to consent um, this is the same way we purchased equipment in the past the same agenda bill but frankly if council would prefer to have it on business that's fine by me I mean I don't have a preference one way or the other if you want to hear the same presentation again okay. as long as the council fully understand what it is that you are increasing the appropriation Yes, I think as a uh, director, uh, as EJ mentioned, even if you've done this before, 
but I think I've heard also from some the council member, I didn't know when we did this. I didn't know, especially if it goes on to the consent agenda. The council member that are here, uh, that are now here, may not necessarily be aware, but mm -hmm. just yeah, as long as everybody point. knows. Yeah, thank you. Uh, council President. Are you done? No, go ahead. Uh, so I assume we're discussing the next agenda item along that's, with this? That's okay. next. That's that's right. Right. So I did ask if um, the budgets, the fund budget, the funds that the um, staff members are being switched to can handle those salaries long term yes. and is it, they can? Yes. All right. Thank you. So actually, that was my question as well. I, I would assume that you'd want to have both of these items on the business agenda because we're actually increasing staffing as well as increasing the budget for the capital. So uh, one uh, suggestion I might have is um, on the eyes on Fedway, uh, in conjunction with what Council President Kahanda was mentioning, uh, you might make a statement that says we will try to get to this within 24 to feet, but however, it may take longer, just so that people aren't expecting something unrealistic yeah, so we we have a scripted response that I says do. we will okay. it, it doesn't have it we've actually removed the number of hours oh. um so it, it basically says we'll get to as soon as we can it's okay a little bit nicer than that but that's pretty much the message okay right now and then my final <laughs> my final question is um do you want to just move both of these items at the same time so that we don't so, go into a second presentation? so i actually have additional item on the staffing one after this so that way you guys could take action one at a time if you want. Okay. So it's up, however the council wants to handle it, that was fine okay. by me. That's fine. We'll just move this one and then get to the next one. So, um, did you want to go ahead? I move to forward option one to the August 10th, 2021 council business agenda for approval. And I'll second that. <laughs> okay. So we Good have morning. a motion and we have a second. Uh, um, any other questions or discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 So the next um, so the next item is uh, what's already been brought up. So is to move. Um, two staff members out of the 101 fund. So move one to the solid waste utility and move one to the arterial street account, which is fund 102, and to backfill the two positions within the 101 fund. So in summary, there's no change in staffing, no increase or decrease in the 101 fund, which is what's funded by the general fund. It remains constant. Um, and the increase in staff of both the 106 and 102 funds um, will be by one position. Um, and to the question that Council President Honda just mentioned um, of how, how do we make this sustainable long term. So we have, um, it's a slightly different answer depending on which fund you're talking about, but for the 106 fund, which is um, the solid waste one, I'll start there. Um, part of what was done with COVID was we've switched to all small scale recycling events as opposed to doing the giant event at Wild Waves. We've recognized a savings of about $40,000 per event or two events per year. Um, and what we're finding is with the smaller events, we're actually diverting more tonnage from the landfill because there's more opportunities um, for multiple and we've actually increased the number of things that can be recycled. So there's certainly some drawbacks on the community side of not having a large event um, that we had a great turnout for and I know the community loved. Um, but the participation in the smaller events has actually increased beyond the numbers we're seeing from one large event. And we're, you know, our goal is to divert tonnage out of landfill, and we're being more successful with that. So with that savings, that, that's where this funds, you know, that's how we're funding this. Um, as of right now, outside of receiving grant funding and being told to go back to large scale events, um, between COVID and frankly, we're doing better with more smaller scale events, I would have a hard time recommending that as a good use of funding to the council. Um, for the 102 fund, we've brought a lot of the small patching in house um, and we've saved money on not hiring contractors. Um, so that is a little bit of a 
struggle workload wise, but we are saving significant amounts of money um, when we can get the staffing to get the work done. Um, we, you know, the arterial fund funds a lot of that maintenance work as well. Um, so again, this is looking at, you know, from a basically a business perspective of how can we leverage funding the furthest, um, you know, and this is, this is the answer. So both of them, again, I would not recommend going back to what we were doing. Um, we're getting more value for money right now the way we're doing it and generating enough savings to cover these two positions. So um, to be clear, this staffing will not get us to that goal number two. So you know, we talked about needing more staff than this to get to pre-2020 levels, um, but it's a step in the right direction. And then to put this into context, um, you know, this was a little bit of curiosity on my part, and then I decided to share it with the council just to be completely transparent. Um, I looked back at the 2020 salary study and the workload study that was done, and it identified that we should have 33 maintenance staff within public works based on our what we're responsible for. So it, to be specific, that means it excludes everything that Lake Haven does, because some cities like Kent do provide water and sewer for portions of their city. So those numbers are backed out. So with that being backed out, we should have 33 maintenance staff based on that study. We have 16 currently. So that was a little bit of a gut check to make sure that we were not missing something. So the policy question before you is, should City Council authorize creation and transfer of one existing litter control position to operate out of solid waste utility fund? Creation and transfer of one existing litter control position to operate, not top operate, out of the arterial street account and backfill the two existing positions within the 101 fund. I will say the same thing that I said for the last one, that um, if council is more comfortable with us going to business, uh, whatever council wants is fine by my perspective. So the options considered are um, to move ahead and create one position in 106 and 102 and to backfill the 101s or to not authorize staff and to provide direction. Mayor's recommendation is option one. And that is a picture from a couple weeks ago of our crew actually out patching a section of the road. And I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, EJ. Um, we have uh, committee members, uh, Linda Koch. Oh, no, I just. I just, just make a motion? Yeah. <laughs> oh, hang on. Um, I think. Um, I just have a quick question. OK, go ahead. Um, are we plan what is currently the response time for the Eyes on Federal Way app when uh, somebody submits a request? Are it, can they see that it's getting assigned out? I remember that was part of the presentation. What's that response time right now? Uh, the response time it's to it's been assigned to the crew. We have it set up to automatically do it. So that, oh, one, okay. that one's pretty much instantaneous. Um, the response to what it is varies it vary. greatly by what it is. So that's if it's litter that's on the route that staff can stop and grab, sometimes we get to it same day. Okay, and I think that's where the messaging was off probably to our residents is that it, I think the messaging should have been we will automatically assign it to someone and you can see that not it will be instantaneously taken care of. but. That's the only comment I had to make. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I do have a question before we uh, make a motion. I just want to make sure that um, I understand this correctly. So with all the moving from one front to another and then backfill the two position, so the net gain is a two that's additional correct. position is that correct yeah yeah well I was trying to be very clear that we're not moving them out of the 101 fund and eliminating those positions um, aka having a savings in the 101 fund. Um, so that that is what I was trying to be very clear about and that's why that that backfilling language is in there okay but yes you are absolutely right thank you uh, thank you chair Tran I move uh, to forward option one to the August 10th, 2021 Business Council Business Agenda for approval. Second. All right, we have a motion and um, second. Any other questions for EJ? No? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 The matter passed 3 0. Thank you, EJ. Thank you. And now we are moving on to. Uh, item E, uh, RFB 
Fatal Way Community Center slide removal. Uh, that would be Jason. Hi. Uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, Chair Tran and Council Members. Um, policy my, uh, question I have before you, I'm, I'm on slate for the next three. They're all RFPs or Bs. And in this one is, should the City Council authorize staff to request bids for the Federal Way Community, Community Center slide removal? And so we've had some discussion on this in the Parks Committee, um, but uh, slide has been failing. It started failing in 2017. Um, based on engineer recommendation, we were able to patch that slide. Uh, the patching uh, was supposed to last one year. Uh, we got it to be able to last three years, and that slide is failing again. I had the engineer back out to relook at it. Um, no recommended measures, and so it's time to replace that slide. Um, if you don't remember from 2017, the slide is, has cancer, is what we're calling it. <laughs> Essentially, um, the rebar was supposed to be coated inside of the structure, and unfortunately, the contractor did not put coated rebar in there. Therefore, the high chlorine environment is causing the uh, rebar to rust, and that rust is pushing its way out of the concrete, causing it to fail. And so, um, Part of the 21-22 budget process, uh, we included this project in, in um, that budget process. Uh, it is slated for 2022. Uh, the funding for that was through a King County Aquatics grant. Um, information has changed since uh, we went through that budget process, and um, what we originally told is um, grants would be available up to 500,000. Um, that has changed now. Grants are only uh, available up to 250,000. And so um, what, we're, what we've decided to do as staff is, is to kind of clean it up a little bit. And we're, we're kind of getting in, in preparation, and, and there's some funding questions that I don't think need to be answered tonight, but uh, maybe need to be on your mind and you need to be thinking about them. And so originally we thought about all one package, demo the slide and put a new one in. And since then, we've, we've uh, reconsidered that, and we thought it would be better to get the slide removed and demoed, get rid of the safety hazard that's out there, um, and then work at bidding um, the replacement slide. And so this RFP and this policy question before you tonight is just strictly, can we go out to bid for the demo? Um, you've got an idea of what that's going to come in, but don't really want to tip my cards um, and just let those proposals set and see where they land. Okay. Um, Mayor, and so options are to uh, approve staff to request bids um, for the slide removal or to not approve that. And the mayor's recommendation is to move forward and allow staff to request bids. Uh, attached a memo, and if you had any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Great, thank you. Very straightforward. Okay, yeah. Oops, I, we don't have any qu questions, so. I stunned you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Oh. Chair, just to, uh, uh, to add a little bit, I think I want to commend the park because even though the funding for this project is in 2022, so they're trying to get ahead of it. Instead of waiting till 2022 to do these, then be the construction, I think I really commend what they're trying to do. And I think uh, uh, the, the, the slide is one of the popular function or the popular item at the performing at, uh, at the uh, uh, community center. So I think the sooner we get to it, the sooner we'll be able to get there. So. And, and I don't know if we'll be back before this committee or, or purse committee, but you know we're going out to request for bid. And um, we are seeing some savings in the 2021 budget out of the operations account at uh, the community center that we may be able to absorb that pay for the demo this year leaving more of that balance available in 2022 to supplement that reduced amount of grant. But um, that is a, a challenge that we're gonna be facing together is, is how we fund this slide um, you know, with the grant. We, we feel we're a strong contender to get a, fully, uh, a full allotment of the grant, um, but uh, we won't know until, until that application uh, occurs. But um, odds are we're gonna have to, to have further discussion on how we fund the, the balance of that slide replacement. Right. Ade, thank you for mentioning that. I love that slide, by the way. I use that. <laughs> I did. All right. I will in entertain um, a motion. I move to forward the 
approval to request bids for the Federal Way Community Center slide removal to the August 10, 2021 City Council consent agenda for approval. I'll second that. Great. I, we have a motion and a second. Any other questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 The matter passed 3 0. We are moving on to item F um, RFP Steel Lake Shop Video Security and Enhancements. Jason. Yes, and so this is a little different. It's a proposal uh, because we've got a kind of a, a mix of what we're, we're going to request um, for here. But the policy question before you is should the City Council approve the request for proposals for Steel Lake Shop Video Security Enhancements? And so uh, there was a memo attached that gave you a little bit of background, but um, as uh, things have changed in, in the city, um, we, we experience break-ins and, and we've been experiencing break-ins on a, on a higher rate. And um, I don't have an exact dollar figure. Uh, those, I, I tried to get them pulled together for this meeting, but um, I was unable to. Uh, that's held in risk and uh, Ryan is, is out of town right now but you know something I'm looking to but what I could pull together I know we're in excess of a hundred thousand dollars worth of thefts um, at the Steel Lake maintenance shop and um, it's not acceptable uh, it's frustrating it diverts staff time when staff should be driving out to go pick up the litter on the street or go open the parks they can't even get out of the yard for, for two hours because they're just having to track and figure out what's been lost, what's gone, and, and um, on a certain level, it's just flat maddening for, for us. And so um, we had had a pretty large dollar uh, theft with a lot of the still power equipment that was stolen out of one of the public works containers last year. And, and at that point, uh, EJ and, and John uh, reached out to Andy and had police conduct kind of a a security evaluation for us uh, that memo was provided and uh, so I won't repeat that but essentially uh, we had some measures to some options that we, we could undertake and um, as you guys are aware we are working at uh, trying to find an alternative in a new shop location and so what we're trying to do is be sensitive to that knowing that you know ideally we're, we're going to move into a new facility but also we don't Feel that we can continue to just accept and, and do nothing with with the thefts and, and the vandalism and break-ins that are occurring um, you know we looked at fencing options to you know go kind of like the UN fencing that would you know goes 20 foot high and that sort of a thing or something similar to wrought iron that that the police secure police area has back here at City Hall and, and you're looking at all 300,000 or, or more uh, for, for those types of things. And so when we just looked at what our options were, um, increased video surveillance with a, it's called guard monitoring. And so it uses some um, artificial intelligence as well as um, when you get what they call a triggered event. So you put in these new cameras. If someone breaks into the yard, something's going to pick that up one of the cameras is going to pick that up analytically it's going to be able to tell us if it's a a cat or a person and but either one is going to qualify for an event and so they're going to be able to that person should pull up a screen 24 hour monitored and they will be able to tell or ascertain whether it's legit activity or not if it's not they will have one-way communication to be able to tell them that police you are being recorded and you need to leave the premises um, all those sorts of things um, and so this request for proposal is for upgrading the cameras and also getting a proposal to have that video guard monitoring and so um, we feel it gives us our best way to help try to reduce the number of thefts and break-ins as well as be cost conscious because we, we, we know we're, we're looking to, to move in somewhere new and, and try to stifle this because the, there are losses and, and frustrations that we can't continue on this path either. And so um, that's why we request that for that proposal. Uh, we do have in mind approximately where it's going to come in. But again, it's another one where I don't want to tip my, my cards and, and we'll see where those proposals come in. The one unknown with this and is, is not uh, been talked about and will be brought forward to you in a, in a further discussion is 
the video guard monitoring, that will be an increased ongoing cost. Uh, but until I see the proposals and what that looks like, um, I, I can't really report to you. And so, uh, you know, what, when I, you know, if someone were to come into the yard, that's considered an event and you get so many events in different packages. Like you can have a package like cell phone minutes, you know, 200 events a month, 400 events a month. And so if a cat comes into the yard, they're gonna turn on the cameras and look at it. That's considered an event, even though there's not a, a burglar or a security risk. And, and do know that we have coyotes, bunnies. We got all sorts of things that come into to the yard. So um, we will get some of those, those false alarms, but that video guarding should um, be clarified in that other way so what if a staff member wants to come into the yard and it's enabled they will have a, a direct 800 line that they can call saying hey I'm staff number X here's my employee number what have you I'm coming into the yard that way it doesn't trigger an event or something to that nature mm -hmm. All right. very good thank you any questions um, thank you chair Tran so, Mr. Gurman, if we change our requirements, is it possible to have an electrified fence? I would have to consult with legal on that. I do know that um, Constantina Wire was, was at one point requested earlier in my tenure with the city, and, and we do have a code that doesn't allow for that. Um, but I would think the legal ramifications from electrifying a fence and the liability associated with that would probably uh, not be allowed, but I... I can't say whether it's permitted or not. I would need to do more research and get back with you on that, but that's just my hunch is probably not. Uh, Council President Honda and then uh, Council Member Barusso. Thank you. So Council Member Kochmar and I have met with some business people here in Federal Way who have requested a fence which is electrified, but it's not doesn't hurt anyone it just shocks them a little bit and then it's like a security system just like you're talking about mm -hmm. and then the security company will call the whoever's on the list to call and say that someone's trying to get into their yard and steal um, they have copper wire wiring and things like that um, according to the last email I got from Brian Davis uh, the mayor has agreed that we can look at changing the code to allow that so uh, this company pays, will pay up, I think it's $12,000 a month for monitoring the fence. And they must have quite a bit stolen if they're gonna be willing to pay that much. They already have quite, they have a fencing system already, but um, people are, are going over the top of it. So uh, my question is if this, what can so at the end of this uh, agenda bill it says that we, we should still expect expect break-ins and my question is what can we do so that we don't expect break-ins what are there security measures we can take that would prevent more than more break-ins and just expect that that's going to happen I, I think the the one thing that comes to, to my mind um, would be it would you would hire on on site security guards and it's you're talking a large property and you would have them there I mean if you want to stop them completely um, you know maybe electric fence I think there's there's not a great answer to I mean there are lots of things we can do if money's unlimited mm -hmm. um, unfortunately there's always competition for dollars and so what we want to try to do is minimize this impact that, that has been occurring to us. And so if we can minimize that until we look to get at these shops, and I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's a combination of things, and it's you know, increased fencing, and whether that's the 20-foot high UN-type fencing that you, you put up, or if it's this electric fencing you're talking about. Um, you know, it's a combination of the, the camera system. I think even if you, you had the greatest fence, you're still gonna you know, have a potential because most fences I know have been cut through at one point or another. And so to say that there's some magic bullet or impenetrable fence, I don't know that that exists. 
And so what we're trying to do is, is minimize the impacts, minimize the, the recovery dollars that we have to come that becomes of this. So, um, and I have to look at the memo completely. I think doing something, we can help minimize and push those down. And even if you can catch someone in the yard where they're doing it, that word's gonna spread that, hey man, they're on to us, they're gonna get us, and you might, might get, get some effectiveness that way. Um, but I think is, if we do nothing, that's absolutely, we've got to expect these continued break-ins. And so that's, was maybe I didn't write it well in my memo, but that was more, more of my, my point, Deputy President Honda, was that you know, we've, I feel like we've gotta do something Doing nothing's just going to continue, and and so, um, it's kind of my, my thought on okay. it. I don't know that I answered your question completely, but so if someone breaks, yeah, and and so Thomas brought up, and and so we're, we had reached out to the city of Bellingham, and, and they had quite a few problems with it was in parking garages, theft, and vandalism, and and they've deployed this system, and so that's. And, and been fairly successful, and, and Thomas okay. may be able to speak that a little bit better, but it's not like we were just shooting out of the dark or, or that. Like I say, we looked at a lot of different options and what are our options and what do all these options cost and what can we recommend and what can we do here for, for our, our maintenance shop that improves it? Because to lose you know $50,000 in weed eaters and blowers, you know, that's not easy for us to replace, and, and if we don't have that stuff, we can't go out and do it. And so, um, again, I wish I had that magic solution because I might be in the security business, but I, I don't have that. And, and so what I'm trying to do is minimize the true impact to the city. Um, so my next question, and I don't know if anyone in the room could answer it, if someone gets into the yard and the police end up there, would that person that's in the yard uh, be arrested for getting into the yard, or is that something that the police, with the new laws that are in effect, nothing would happen? Well, they're it's a great question. It, to me, you've trespassed at that point. We have no trespassing signs up. They're not an okay. employee, and they're not entitled to be there. So in my mind, I feel like police have some, some action. Now, the new laws are, are different, and what circumstances happen when the police approach could dictate what the police can do and what they can't do, but I'm not a law enforcement expert right. e either, so I, I'm not gonna speak to that, but uh, in my mind, they're trespassing, they're not welcome, the gates were locked, police should have the ability to enforce that. And that would be during the commission of a crime since it's fenced off. So it, they would be able to stop them. Okay, thank you. Also, just so that the council know, they've taken live copper wire we've lost life that supposed to be life. So if they can take that and cut that off, you know, I think other than having a guard there or a monitored system, I don't think there's anything that will prevent this theft. I mean, I was so surprised that they, somebody was able to cut a life for wire without, I mean, and we're talking like 480 volts, so it's, I mean, it's, it's electricity that'll kill you, but they're brazen enough and, and have and have done it in the past, and yeah. Well, I'm wondering, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Tran, I'm wondering if uh, you, I'm going through your requirements that you're looking at regarding, regarding improvements, the most secure option and then adequate option. I'm wondering if, when you're looking at that, and you're going to do your RFP here pretty soon. I don't know if we'd be able to change our code by then, but um, if you consider the electrifying the fence in some manner. And so I think think with this RFP that we've put together and is before you tonight, it, it's not necessarily geared toward the fencing approach. Kind of, okay. I think the people who are going to be bidding on on this proposal is going to be those security companies, those monitoring, it. Uh, monitoring companies, okay. those. Uh, you know, okay. Thank yeah, you. camera, camp, video surveillance. Um, and so um, if it changed in time and, and we had approved and appropriated funding to, to do something with that on the fence, uh, we would absolutely look into that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Council Member LaRusso. Ah, thank you, Chair Tran. Thank you, Jason. Just a quick question, because I didn't see any language in the RFP, and it's probably being included, but on servicing of the equipment, I think it's 24-7. So they had to service something in the middle of the night, they come out? So uh, the 24-7 regards to the video monitoring? Or just servicing, because you have servicing in here on the equipment itself, I saw. So I'm just kind of wondering if that service include 24-7 on the equipment so to, to me, the 24-7 would be the monitoring of the, the video guard system. Okay. Is in regards to after the initial install, all the cameras are up in, in that. Um, now the monitoring company is going to have a component to that. Part of the AI is like, if you've got a camera looking at that back door there, you can set a hot zone where, hey, it's the door, and you kind of make that area red, and, and it's really going to focal, focus on that way, and the artificial intelligence is, is going to key in. Um, and now I just I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry, <laughs> Councilman okay. Russo. Would you ask that question? So really, when I'm just I'm just wondering if if a camera goes down. Yeah. And oh, so who that's, services the camera? We. Or is that Thomas in the IT department. Okay. We, we did not include funds in that's that. We don't have funding for an ongoing okay. camera maintenance contract. So I okay. call Thomas and the help desk, and, and they, will, they will keep the cameras up and running for the life of the cameras. Okay. And, and to answer your question, uh, Councilmember Russo, it's the proposal is requesting a typical one-year warranty for that equipment. And so um, with, with maintenance, so they'll come out if we call them, if there's a problem with the thing. Most of the equipment that this proposal is targeting is, is um, stuff that we've already used in the past. It comes with a three-year warranty on it. So at least we'll have um, okay. the ability to replace the piece of equipment if a camera does fail, but that's on us to actually do the, you know, go out there and up the pole and, and unscrew the camera and replace it. Okay. So not, not the vendor. Okay. They're installing it, but they're not maintenance it. Right. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I, I do have a, a follow-up question on that, because if um, our IT staff have to maintain that system, are you anticipate a huge workload to maintain those <laughs> video cameras and equipments? So I a funny story is uh, I hired a, a, a position, um, Jerry, who you, you may have may not met, um, as a as a network specialist, and I should have said Safe City Camera Specialist because probably ninety percent of his job is that. Um, with this stuff, by putting it, we're replacing pretty much everything out there from wireless infrastructure um, to the cameras themselves. Everything will be brand new, and that's the best way to do it. Now that being said, things do fail. And we do do, we do experience that from time to time, but by doing this, we're all we're also having the vendor do it. So it's kind of taking the initial workload off of us. We're going to be working with them, you know, making sure that the, the equipment is programmed appropriately with the right technical um, configuration and settings to work with our network and work with our servers. But that being said, they're going to actually be doing the install, so that we did want to factor that into this proposal because we wanted to take at least that initial load off of us. Um, as far as the maintenance um, and operation of this support be, being all new, um, it should be relatively low. The cameras that we have out there right now um, have been relatively low maintenance. Um, they're just aging out is the problem. Um, they've been up there a while. There's only one like really brand new camera. All the rest have been up there for several years. So they're- Since 2010. Yeah, they're aging out. Great, just, um, I just don't wanna create additional workload for you guys, so. Thank at, you. <laughs> at the end of the day, I appreciate um, appreciate it with anything. We're replacing what we already have out there, so it wouldn't really be additional workload. Um, it'd just be more of the same. Okay. Very well. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? If not, then I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Chair Tran, I move to forward uh, the approval to request proposals for Steel Lake Shop Video Security Enhancements to the August 10th, 2021, Council Agenda for approval, Consent Agenda for Approval. I second. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. Any other questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Matter passed 3-0, and we are moving on to item G, police gate replacement. All right, Jason? we're a bit crazy here tonight, and here we are for number three. And so 
Uh, policy question we have before you tonight is should the city council authorize staff to request bids to replace uh, fail, uh, the police gates at City Hall? And so um, we've been having problems with the gates for about three years now. Um, the gates are original to the building. They're the wrought iron gates that you see to the secure police area. Um, we have had to shut down either the north or south gate um, at least a half dozen times each. Um, the north gate, which is used most, was, was shut down for, for about three month time period and we were able to find a welder that could get it replaced. Um, at the time we were, we were looking to uh, replace the gates. Uh, couldn't quite get the gates to come in on the budget we had available and then kind of COVID hit and um, just kind of wiped us out. But we had had that welder out to repair that north gate. At that same time when, when the, the north gate was, was down, we recognized we did not have badge entry on the south gate. And so staff has installed that badge entry. And so you can enter and exit through both the north and south gate where it used to be only, you could only enter, um, you could only exit through the south gate, you could only enter through the north gate. So now the south gate has failed and, and uh, has ripped the metal. Basically it's, it's shredded the metal had the same welder out, asked him if he could weld that gate up. Unfortunately, uh, it is damaged beyond repair. So the South Police Gate has been um, closed and unoperational. We're probably going on about eight weeks now, maybe 10 weeks. And so we need to go out here because if the North Gate fails, um, we're in trouble. And so we could manually get those gates open um, but you would have to probably station somewhere to keep the security available or you're going to have to manually move that gate which uh, to me is not really feasible so we are going out to request the gates uh, we did some preliminary work with with some people and um, several of them wanted to acknowledge and say that the gate the automated gate openers also had to be replaced um, between my staff, consultation, consultation with EJ and some of his staff, um, we don't believe that's accurate. So, and we don't necessarily have the funding to, to replace the automation as well as the, the wrought iron gates. And so we're going out for an RFP that specifically states we're just asking for the gates to be replaced using the existing automation. And so, uh, I'm a little bit hopeful that that's gonna to come to fruition and, and, and that's the case, but um, if not, we'll be back to, to have further discussion. And so um, that's strictly what it is to fabricate and swap those gates out uh, using existing automation. Uh, the funding for this was approved in the most recent, recent budget adjustment and I'd point you there for that as a, again, it's a, a request for proposal or bid and so I don't wanna reveal my cards on that number. I'd be, uh, so two, two options, approve, uh, option one, approve uh, staff request to go out to bid, or option two, do not, and uh, give us some direction, and the mayor's option, recommending option number one. Great, thank you. Committee members, have any questions? Any other council members? Very straightforward. All right. I move approval of the request for bids to replace the police gate at City Hall. Oh wait, sorry. I move to forward the proposed request for bids for the police gate replacement at City Hall to the August 10, 2021 consent agenda for approval. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Matter passed 3-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Shan and Council Members. Appreciate it. Thank you. And now we are moving on to item H. Um, not sure how to pronounce this, but um, AV Cholum Safe City Server RFB Award. Thomas. A Vigilon is the correct pronunciation of that. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Tran, committee, and council members. I'm here to present um, a quote approval. Share my screen and get this set up for you. Actually, it's the timing is perfect because now I can talk on like what this server will be used for. So um, 
the before you is an Invigilon MVR server purchase. Uh, we went out for quotes and uh, received them back, and I'm going to present them to you tonight. Uh, but on the heels of um, Deputy Director Gerwin's presentation about the Steel Lake Maintenance Yard, that whole system runs on these servers. So this actual physical server that sits downstairs uh, and stores all of the video, not just for Steel Lake, but for all of our, it's one of five, it will be one of five servers that we have down there that store all this. So an excessive 200 terabytes of video data, which is a lot of video data. Um, and that will store video for approximately somewhere between, we, we like to guarantee seven days, um, we're seeing on average between 10 and 20 days, just depending on the, the server load and, and, and the scene like that it's, that it's looking at. So that gives you the, a, a use case for this. So um, before you tonight, this particular RFQ, we went out uh, for publication um, for the Fiddleway Mirror and we published it on the city's website. It was published on July 16th and the submissions were due on the 23rd. Uh, only for a week because it's a parts only order, nothing basic. The vendors just literally have to take our specs, put the prices and send it our way. There's not a whole lot to it. So we didn't have to have it open for a lot. Um, and then notification of the selected candidate. Um, we did this one a little differently. We wanted to make sure it runs through the council process full, gets awarded and then we'll let them know. Uh, so that'll be after the uh, August 10th um, council meeting. So included in this request is a bunch of technical jargon, uh, basically a server and some accessories. And, and, and a four hour mission critical service level agreement, uh, Council Member Barusso. So that's, that's uh, for Dell to cover the, uh, the actual server itself, so any parts or anything that fails. Five bidders, believe it or not, responded, um, considering that we only published in two locations. Um, our particular preferred uh, vendor security solutions responded and then there was also four others uh, I say preferred because we've done business with them in the past and they are uh, very nice to work with and they're local however uh, they weren't the lowest bidder in this case um, and so we have a total presented cost there um, you can see that the highest was a1 security supply at 38 and almost 39,000 and then the KUBL group is 27425. Um, they are saying the lead time is five to seven weeks. The high security people are saying I can obtain items within 30 days, which is not necessarily correct. We, fo we followed uh, up with a Vigilon, direct the manufacturer, and uh, asked them of what their lead time is, and it's more or less five to seven days. Or sorry, five to seven weeks. So it's more along those lines. And then we just had to factor in the only asterisk uh, there is that their proposal didn't include sales tax. We always have to pay sales tax regardless. Um, and so we needed to put that in there. So we scored them based on uh, three criteria, responsiveness, price, ability, and history, uh, both awarded five points apiece. And then we started everybody out with five and we subtracted one point for things that they did not do um, to, to, that, uh, to that selection. Came out with 93% uh, with the rate weighted criteria uh, with the KUBL group. Um, so not only with um, the price, but also with our criteria still exceeded, um, so with the 93%. The, reason, the way that we're funding this is from a 2018 um, Edward Bryan Memorial Justice or JAG grant. Uh, the total award amount for that JAG grant was 31,394. And is awarded for what was called safe city server and network infrastructure and the remaining three thousand nine hundred sixty nine dollars that we are not spending on this particular server will be used for network infrastructure improvement that's all i have happy to answer any questions great thank you committee members any questions mm -hmm. council members nope you get out the hook easy <laughs> oh man i was all yeah. prepared too <laughs> oh Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Tran. Sorry, Thomas. Hey, no worries. <laughs> Just a quick question on the, could you go back to the slide of the uh, selection criteria? Yes. Thank you. Can. So my, the only question I have is number one is, uh, were all the groups given that selec selection criteria, number one? Well, one, one thing, I'm gonna, I gotta share the screen okay. again, a different way. 
because I... Uh, I just wanted to see differences, too. There we go. Okay. Okay. So, again, the question is, did all did the uh, five companies see the selection criteria before? So we... we uh, yes. Um, I believe the in your packet for council, the actual RFP was... Um, awarded. I can pull it up. It'll, it would just take me a moment to get to it. Um, but yes, we do. That's that is upfront with them. Uh, responsiveness, price, and ability and history. And then we have a little bit of blurb underneath them. So that is part of the RFP uh, that goes out and that is published. Is there feedback given back to them after this? Why did they get selected at all? Um, we we notify all the vendors uh, usually via email that hey, this is either you are selected or you are not. Um, and some vendors do request to see this scoring matrix, um, which is what you have in front of you. I couldn't fit this all nicely into a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> right. so that's why I did a kind of abridged version uh, for PowerPoint to kind of get just the critical details. But yeah, we'll send this. I mean, this is public record. It's all, all good. We've done it many times before, and we'll send that um, back out to them. Okay. All right, I'm just kind of looking for but maybe down the road if someone else wants to, if they ever want to come back and bid again for something else. You know. Well, yeah, no, we, we encourage that. Um, as a matter of fact, I mean, all these these four, A1, ADS, High Security, and the KUBL group are all new to us. Okay. Um, we've actually chased off a couple vendors because we do this a lot, um, and it's interesting how the bidding process goes, and usually our preferred is the lowest, which is Security Solutions, and he just didn't get there this time. I don't know why. I'll have to ask him. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. So, Thank no you. worries. It was probably the shipping and sales tax. <laughs> well, we have to pay sales tax regardless. Um, so regard on whoever. But yes, I mean, freight is one of them. But um, Security Solutions is only charging $125 for freight. So if you look at the... Um, because the KUBL group included both shipping freight and sales tax in their correct number yeah they did an all-in-one item so i don't know if they're just trying to get our business and just taking a loss on this one or no or very little profit i don't know but toby's margins uh, toby, security solutions mar margins are pretty thin when it comes to that uh, and he's been pretty upfront with us so again these guys i mean i'm i'm looking forward to uh to seeing them it's always good to have another vendor uh, to be able to do business with, so looking forward to it. So, Chair Tran, I move to for the proposed award of the Evagelon Safe City Server to the August 10, 2021 Consent Agenda for approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, any other questions? Seeing none. On favor, please say aye. 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 Matter passed three zero. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we are moving on to item I, AP voucher from June 16 until July 15, 2021, and payroll voucher from the 1st of June until June 30th of 2021. Chase? Yeah. Good Welcome. evening, Council Chair Tran, Council President Honda, Council Committee members. Before you, as Council Chair Tran just stated, are the AP vouchers in the amount of $3,844,260.56 and payroll vouchers in the amount of $3,967,629.74. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions you may have before this meeting. We did send an email with the responses to the questions that were asked prior to the meeting, but I'd be happy to answer any others that you may have. Thank you. I don't see any questions. Mm -hmm. Wow. You always look at me. <laughs> <laughs> you always ask good questions, so. <laughs> no questions? Okay. I moved for the vouchers to the August 10th, 2021 consent agenda for approval. And I'll second there. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other questions? Yes. Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Matter passed 3-0, and uh, we are coming down to our last item, item J, monthly financial report for June 2021, and our most famous professor a day.
channel. Uh, Council, I just want to quickly summarize some of the areas in this uh, report. So I don't. Uh, city as a whole, actually, we're doing really well. And hopefully, I'll be able to show you some specific <coughs> funds that may not be doing well. But the city as a whole, we're doing well. Uh, and I've highlighted a couple of areas uh, in your report. The sales tax. It's about 0.6 million or 9.4 percent above 2021 year to the budget. Uh, so that means at least we are coming out of uh, this uh, recession and uh, 0.76 million or 12.3 above what we did last year at the same time last year. Uh, the CD permits and fees, that is about 300,000 or 26 percent above the 2021 year to date budget or 0.6 million, or 53% above what we did last year. If you remember, by this time last year, we we're already in the lockdown. So we need to be careful actually comparing ourselves to what we did last year, because this time last year, we were total lockdown. Uh, parks and rec fees are below 2021 year to date, uh, budget and 275,000 or 50, Two percent, you know, but eighty thousand or forty-seven percent above twenty twenty year to date actual. Our admission tax, which is being paid monthly, and uh, we've collected about forty-one thousand, which is twenty thousand below the actual last year, and this is due to the AMC movie theater closing and the COVID nineteen. But if you look at this individual revenue, you look at our sales tax, the year to date this time last year was about 6.2 million. Uh, this year, we have about 6.9 million. So we are doing reasonably okay. Admission tax, this time last year, we've done 61,000. Now, we've only done 41,000. Uh, the CD permit, by this time last year, we've done about one point one million now we've done about 1.6 million so we are doing really really good uh public works permit the same thing this time last year 332 now 384 and all of those numbers are pretty much higher than even the year to day budget uh, lake haven franchise fees because now we are collecting utility tax on them we can no longer charge them franchise fees and the passport, because the city hall has been locked down, so, so far, that is really zero. But as a whole, in this general fund, what this is showing is we've actually collected or earned $263,000 more than we projected in our budget. But that is not the end. If you look at the bottom here, that means we spent $1.1 million less than what we should have spent. So we're doing well revenue-wise, and we're doing well in the uh, spending category. But you can see some revenue are doing well, some spending, or even some department have gone over, and some are spending less. But in total, we're underspending our budget, and we're earning more than we anticipate. So that is where you want to be. So that's a good, good thing. Uh, Council Member Coachman, I think, uh, you know, and I want to, you know, it was your initiative that created this uh, jail fund, just to let you know, uh, it's under year to day budget, again, because our ADP, and I hope as we go along, the Council keep a tab on this, so that the essence of establishing that fund is maintained. When it is not spent, it stays in there for a rainy day when the ADP will be 120 or whatever it is, because that is the essence of establishing that fund. But so far, we're doing really, really good because the ADP has been way lower 
than the 70 that we budgeted for. Uh, of course, the utility tax is doing really well. The good news about this uh, also the utility tax. I think I shared with you last time that uh, the uh, Lake Haven challenged items that should be taxed or be exempted. So when we send them the guidelines and all of that, they agree. And that money anyway, they've already collected from the citizen. So they send us a check for over 600,000. So that is part of why the revenue utility tax is actually where it is and I'm very happy and I think that is part of why the revenue is that good. Are they? I'm sorry to interrupt you a little bit, but I do want to recognize um, council members more. So Thank, like, you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I have a question. Yeah. When will we start doing passport applications again? Uh, now that the city hall is open, actually, if you have an opportunity before you go, if you can walk to that direction, we actually have uh, there's a, a monitor screen to be able to help people where they want to go. And since the city hall opened, they've been very, very busy. So now that the city hall is open, so when you are looking at July, you know, uh, uh, monthly financial report, you will see some major activities in there. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, what our sales tax uh, looks like. I think uh, looking at this, you can see how well we did compared to the budget. Other than the February, where we had uh, uh, 28,000 lower than uh, what we did in 2020, we've actually helped perform 2020. Again, remember that this time last year, we were already in total lockdown. Uh, this is uh, our utility tax. I think uh, that really also zero in on the $600,000 that we, uh, more than $600,000 that we received from Lake Haven. That is why the revenue that we got in June actually went over the uh, estimated budget by more than a million is because of that 600000 because that 600000 is paying the utility tax on all of those items that they didn't for the past three years. So when we went to, uh, uh, to court, we identified items that qualify for these taxes. Say, well, uh, uh, you know, if you are having to get shut, uh, shut off your system, turn it back on, does that qualify for utility tax? If uh, you have a return check and you charge the citizen, does that qualify? What we did, we just followed the guideline of the state and what we're doing with all the other utility providers, and that is what uh, generated that additional 600000 Again, that is uh, if you compare what we did last year, by this time last year, we haven't collected anything so I think uh, when you get into uh, July, August, then you be able to see comparison with last year. On real estate excise tax, I think uh, as some of uh, what uh, the real estate agents are saying, this is the seller's market. And uh, some of the prices are just going through the roof. So I think uh, for this year, We've done excellently well, even way better. I thought maybe we did good last year, but this year it seems to be starting really hard <coughs> as well. Uh, for the police overtime, I think uh, the council authorized additional 200,000 uh, at the last council meeting for the uh, police overtime. This is where we are. The month of June overtime increase of 27,000 above the 2020 year to date actual is primarily due to the increase in special events and an increase in shift call in overtime. So, but I think that the additional 200,000 that the council gave them, hopefully I think that will help 
in uh, the special patrol that needs to be done to have a handle on the, uh, on the crime. Uh, pretty much the jail service that we just talked about, this is the total budget for this year, about 3.3 million. In six months, we've only spent 805, again, because of the ADP. So I can, unless the whole hell break loose, I can almost guarantee that by the end of the year, we will have a substantial amount on spent in that fund, and I think that will go into the reserve, hopefully to be able to, you know, uh, 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 take care of any excess ADP in the future or whatever the council decides to, to do. Uh, just so that we don't lose sight, even though this is in the report every time, I just want to let you know, because we left the score, we're still servicing the debt that we incur in construction of score. So our portion, at least as of the end of the last year, is still 10.6 million that is outstanding. At some point, if you build a big reserve in that jail fund, that can be used to quickly pay off this debt and get out of uh, the bond if that is what the council choose to do at that time. <coughs> Traffic safety, red light, I think, uh, again, that is picking up. Uh, if you see what we did last year, that was mostly negative because, I mean, it was totally shut down. So we're doing better now that everybody is uh, traveling. So we've actually done better than last year already. This is a Federal Way Community Center, and you've heard a lot of uh, uh, activities uh, uh, today. So uh, as of now, uh, based on the current budget, we plan to transfer from general fund 32,000, about 33,000. As of the end of June, we've transferred all of that. Uh, we're supposed to also budget it for 279,000. As of the end of June, we've done all of that. So. At the half of the year, the total support from the city to community center is covered. So I hope that the revenue stream will improve. And if you look at this, and it's because the facility has not been opened. So most likely, before the end of the year, there may be a need to either increase the support for community center. Otherwise, your policy that says they must maintain 1.5 may not. And that may be uh, something that the city may be written up on that we do not maintain what the council policy specify. But I think it's due to the lockdown. We haven't been able to do any service. And of course, we are trying to maintain staff in there to prevent any kind of uh, uh, damage to the, to the facility. Dumas Bay, uh, on the other side, I think uh, we budgeted 227 uh, to be transferred. So far this year, we've only done two or four. So we've done less than, and they're still maintaining, <laughs> I think, uh, their 1.5 that they're supposed to have. Uh, for the Performing Heart Center, again, for this year, we plan to, uh, to transfer into them or to support them by over a million dollars so far we've only done about 339, so that is really good. So I think they are doing, they are, they are doing well. And by the way, I think uh, 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 we've received, I think which have Mr. Uh, Tim Johnson probably shared that with you at the last uh, council, member, uh, council meeting. We've received the grant that they applied for, so that is good. And I think they're gonna keep that as a reserve in there. So as a whole, 
you know, the city is doing well. Yes, general fund, this is what is required, 9.5 million. We have 19.8 because we got about 10 million of ARPA funding. So now because we've done something miraculously, so that is why that is at 19. Uh, and as I advise uh, the council, I hope that we will wait till we're sure we can, the, the revenue that th we think we're entitled to, till the state confirm that, yep, then the city can plan on how to spend that. The last thing we want to do is to spend the money, and when we do the audit, and they say, nope, you know, I think you are not entitled to that much, and start taking that funding away. Yeah, so our utility tax, as of the end of June, we have about 4.7 million, even though the fund balance is about 1.5. So that is part of what I'm saying we're doing really well, and part of that is also because of the expansion of utility tax. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Federal Way Community Center is supposed to have 1.5. As of now, it's 1.37, so it's low. And I think uh, if we are at this in June, I can see that going below that by the end of the year. So I think the city should be planning on either uh, 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 increasing <coughs> the support to that fund. Traffic safety light, that is doing really well compared to what the reserve is supposed to be. Uh, real estate, you know, two million. We are a little bit over two million. That is good. Uh, this is the solid waste, the new utility tax that is levied. So I think hopefully with uh, the budget amendment, we probably will amend that so that the portion from last year, 2020, since we started collecting that money last year, also can be transferred into this fund. So that in total, two years from now, five years from now, you can actually see the entire amount that has been collected and spent out of that 10% utility tax. Uh, unemployment insurance, I think because of COVID, that is, that is a little bit lower than what it should be. Again, in order to meet your requirement, that may be part of the budget amendment at the end of the year to make sure we bring that to what your policy says it should be. And uh, uh, also another quick uh, uh, note, uh, as part of the state legislators, they passed the support of uh, body camera I think we got 396,000. So, uh, yes, uh, will that really cover the total of all of our body camera? No, but that will certainly go a long way. Mm -hmm. They pay that amount based on the legislation, I think about $4 per capita. So it was, uh, it was calculated based on population. So $4 per, per capita. So they multiply $4 by the number of population that they think we have. And uh, I think that was included in the legislation that we will get it before the end of uh, July. So that is good. Nice. I think that is all I have on that. Thank you, Ade. Um, committee members, any questions? I do. Go ahead, please. So uh, thank you, Chair Tran. So I'm, I'm still um, trying to track it. So the, your double asterisk here says the general and street fund, but you just said, um, had uh, 10 million received in June from the American Rescue Act funds. Mm -hmm. That is what Are we is. still expecting ARPA funds in addition to this? Uh, yes, actually the total amount that is, uh, we're supposed to get is uh, 19 million plus. So they sent half. The exact amount is about, I think, about nine million six hundred and thirty, something like that. Yes, they sent us half of it, uh, uh, and they will send the other balance later. Just so that you know, even though they sent that nine, uh, 10 million, our initial calculation of lost revenue for 2020 is a little bit less than 13 million. 
So it is possible. What is left, six million, we may be able to claim that also as a lost revenue. Where if we're able to get all of this 19, almost 20 million as a lost revenue, when it becomes city's money, two years from now, you are free reasonably to spend it on whatever. But to simply answer your question, yes, we're expecting the balance later. So, so I'm trying to track this. So the, the money that's coming in, that did come in and will come in, is all supposed to go to, well, right now you've got it going to the um, General Street Fund. I'm sorry, we put it in general fund, correct, yes. And I think uh, if it turns out we will be able to, it's even lower than what we are claiming as a loss now. I think we can redistribute it to street light, to performing, uh, to performing heart center, where we actually had the loss. Thank you, well, I'm, I, I'm understanding that some of that money is supposed to go to the community, is that correct? Uh, revenue loss is city's money. No, uh, not for the revenue loss. Isn't aren't they supposed to send some ARPA funny, ARPA fund monies that, that go to the cities to be distributed to the community? Uh, nope. Because I know the chamber is going to be requesting some money. Uh, yeah, if they are requesting some of the money from your lost revenue, that is their prerogative. The 19 million DRPA uh, that was included in my PowerPoint presentation. There are four categories that you can spend that money on. Lost revenue is just one of them. You can use it to develop some utility. You can use it to develop fiber optic. You can use it to support local businesses. That may be the portion that the chamber wants to come and ask for. But if the city's lost revenue is more than 20 million, if you want to give any other businesses out of that, hmm. you can do that, but so. Hmm. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? You know, before I uh, call the vote um, on this item, um, I just want to say on behalf of this committee, I want to say thank you uh, for your service. Uh, to this city and to the people of Federal Way, especially for our committee here. Um, and for me, um, I want to thank you uh, for your guidance and support that you have given me for the last uh, almost two years since I became the chair of this committee. Um, I couldn't have done it without you. Um, thank you. So I wish you well on your retirement. Thank you, Arde. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. um, after we, you vote, and I was going to say we vote, um, if everyone could just stay in here for a second. I have, mm -hmm. we Thank you. have something for a day. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and vote. Um, I move to forward the June 2021 um, monthly financial report to the August 10, 2021 consent agenda for approval. And I second that. Okay. We have a motion and the and the second. Um, any other questions? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 The matter passed 3 0. Our next meeting, it is going to be on August uh, 24th, 2021, uh, at Chair, 5 p.m. Sorry. In the past, and that is, of, co of course, up to the committee. In the past, the committee did not meet in August. And I, actually, that is why I put that under the other item. So, Yes, if you want to meet, yes, that is your, but in the past, they've skipped the meeting in August, so, but you thank have you. to address that and. Thank you for that reminder, and if we can take off in August, <laughs> I am pretty sure all the council members would yep. like that idea. Yes, so there's do. no meeting for FEDRAC's committee in the month of August. You're not in the committee. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank this you. This meeting is concluded. Thank you. More than just the chamber. <laughs>